National Association for Business Analytics and Certification. Our speaker for today is Mr. Pradeepta Mishra, and the topic is Explainable AI, Unboxing the Black Box Model for AI Adoption. Let me give you a brief intro about our speaker for today. Pradeepta is a TEDx speaker and was listed under the 40 under 40 data scientists for the years 2019 and 2020. Uh, he's an author of five books on AI and he has uh, 16 plus years of experience in, uh, and is currently heading, uh, heading the AI for Phosphor. And he's leading a group of data scientists in computational linguistic experts, machine learning and deep learning experts in creating value and expertise across core branches of artificial intelligence, including image processing, audio processing, NLP, NLG, and NLI, and the design implementation for expert systems and personal digital assistants. So this is a brief about Mr. Pradeepta, the speaker for today. Over to you, Pradeepta. Thank you, Ram. Thank you for the introduction. I'll quickly share my screen. Good afternoon, everyone. And let me know once you're able to, once you're able to see my screen. Is it visible now? Yes, Pradeepa. Right. Okay. You can see my screen, right? Okay, fine. Perfect. So today we are uh, at the at the cusp of using the AI to drive value. Now, first thing we have to understand is what is AI. And what are the typical business problems or typical scenarios where we can use the artificial intelligence to extract value? Okay. The definition of AI is if we can get to know things in advance, then we can take decisions. If we can predict things in advance, well in advance, then we can decide strategies around it, right? It is applicable across different business functions, verticals. And today, the one thing that is fueling this kind of uh, AI uh, like expansion is data, computations, and cloud. So traditionally, we are unable to get the data, the volume of data, the right data. And then we were not able to perform computations because of the limitation of a computing device. Now today, we have GPUs, TPUs to provide augment the computations. So we are getting more data in comparison to the historical uh, uh, or in, in comparison to previous years. We are getting good uh, computing powers, the machines, and we are also now able to convert the mathematics or statistics that we have studied long back, my, maybe years, years back, and we are able to convert it into programs. And why it was not been done? Because we don't have any, we did not have any computational power. That's why those mathematics were in, in books only. Now today, the complex mathematics execution is pretty simple using the computational power of the machines. So evolution of those three things, data, computing power and algorithms, it gives immense opportunities for us to apply those mathematical, statistical, or any kind of computational algorithms to predict the future, take business decisions, and also it is applicable across different business functions. So the objective of AI is to gain insights and intelligence. Now, why it is artificial intelligence? Because Direct intelligence is about if you are knowing things that is direct intelligence, but sometimes it is hard to get direct intelligence. That's why using artificial intelligence means we are able to generate predictions for the future. Now that predictions are generated by the algorithms. Now those algorithms can be classified into machine learning algorithms and deep learning algorithms, right? So machine learning algorithms means it's a computer program that learns how to, that exactly learns how to perform better a particular task and improve over time by learning new and new amount of data. So the machine learning is about making predictions about the future again, generating recommendations and identifying patterns in the data. So the machine learning can be broken into three areas at a very high level, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and other algorithms. Supervised al algorithms means you know the ground truth about the input and output. And if you make some changes in the input, you will be able to see those changes in the output. And if input is like uh, like in a future, so suppose you are getting a new data, 
Now, what would be the output that you, you should be able to predict it? The unsupervised part of it is basically understanding the groups, understanding the patterns, recognizing the patterns, and uh, associating the patterns with the algorithmic patterns and making uh, some kind of insights from there, right? Deep learning is a special case of machine learning where the amount of features, or you can say the dimensions of the data is quite high. For example, like image processing. So image has to be converted into pixels. Those pixels are necessarily like uh, RBG based numbers. And these RBG based numbers for a high resolution image could be very, very huge, right? So to reduce the dimensions of data and bringing the dimensions of the data to a certain extent and then applying a neural network model on top of it, that's part of your deep learning. So this is applicable for a image kind of analysis. Now, the same thing can be extended to video analysis. It can be extended to audio analysis. It can be extended to natural language processing as well. So whenever the dimensions of the data is quite big, like number of columns, number of records are quite sparse or very, very large, in those scenarios, the machine learning models won't be able to perform or won't be able to provide good accuracy. That is why it's important to apply a deep learning technique there or deep learning modeling uh, technique over there to get better, stable, and more accurate models. So having said that, what stops the organizations in adopting the AI solutions, right? Why, why somebody is not taking those AI solutions, right? Now, when I say AI, if it's parameterized, which means simpler models like a linear regression or very much simpler like a, a if else conditions, it's quite easy to adopt. The businesses are open to that. However, the moment we get into the complex models like neural network models or a deep learning model in order to make predictions, then here the complexities, these are considered as black box models. Why it is black box? Because the neural network models are designed to take the input data and produce the output data by doing some kind of processing. Now, what is that some kind of processing? Now that is basically nothing but you have, the data is converted into neurons. Neurons means one small unit of computation and each neuron or inputs for computations, it takes random values, right? And it, it is spread across different layers. So you can say these are called hidden layers. So in a neural network model, the hidden layers can be one or more than one. The neurons that are present in each of the hidden layers can be many. Now, each neuron can assume a starting value or initialized value, which is a small random number. And the network learns on its own by using the technique called back, like it's called back propagation technique. So using the back propagation technique, it iterates over time and learns the patterns that are provided by the machine from the input data to generate the predictions. Now, this process is so complicated that we cannot explain it to anyone that what exactly it is doing. Right. So the current systems, or maybe I can say uh, maybe a year back, if you just analyze the situations, like if we are using a neural network model, there is no provision to explain it. That's why the neural network models are called the black box models. Right. So parameterized models, it's quite easy for the organizations to adapt. However, they are subject to, uh, like we can say, they produce less accuracy sometimes, they produce, uh, they fail to recognize certain patterns at sometimes. So you need complex models. So simpler models may not work in real life because there are so many complexities around the data and patterns. That is why it is important to bring in the neural network kind of models into the, into the data. Now, when we bring neural network, suddenly the modeling, whole modeling scenario becomes a black box. If I don't know, how the input and output is working, then I cannot explain it to anyone. Now that is actually stopping various organizations from adopting the AI-based solutions or predominantly the deep learning-based solutions, right? The machine learning-based solutions, it is still fine, but the deep learning-based uh, solutions, there is slight bit of a hesitation in adopting it. And why? The reasons are trust. Now, how can, how can I trust that whatever prediction the model is generating it is true. How can I rely on the results? What kind of reliability? What is the degree of reliability associated with your predictions? Is it fair enough? 
Is it your model is discriminating against one, one particular group versus other groups? Is it uh, fair to all the groups? So the fairness could be uh, evaluated based on various conditions. It could be race, sex, uh, religion. It could be some other factors as well. It should not, the ideal scenario, the model should not discriminate based on any of the parameters. It should consider each and every individual or candidate as equal. So how, how, how or what degree of fairness associated with your models? Is it, is it transparent enough? Is it really giving you insight about how exactly the computation happens? If something goes wrong, how exactly the, the computation changes? So it's very important to make your model predictions transparent enough, privacy aware, which means it should not take into consideration the individual data, the personalized information into computations. Even if it is doing that, it should be transparent enough. Accountability. Sometimes, sometimes we generate the predictions. We say that, hey, these are the predicted values for this particular event, it's going to happen, right? Now, what if it doesn't happen? So false predictions could lead to incorrect business decisions. Now, the accountability of generating those false predictions lies on the data scientist who has developed those models, right? So you need to understand the importance of generating a prediction. Based on your prediction, somebody else is taking a business decision. That decision has to be right. But if that decision backfires and it is not, in, it's not correct, then the accountability again rests on the person. Why did you generate such kind of predictions? So accountability is important and safety also. Sometimes the AI algorithms, they could be used to do, like for example, we're using AI algorithms for self-driving cars. Now safety standards would be also maintained. The self-driving cars should not kill anyone, should not uh, run over uh, anything, any living being, right? So ideally safety conditions also should be taken into consideration. But these are the factors that are important while considering or while uh, thinking about bringing AI to the system. Okay. Now, what is AI system? So the AI system is nothing but AI system is is, a, is something where uh, you could say you could say there is an input to the AI system. There is uh, uh, like output from the AI system. Now, what is the input to the AI system? The input is data model and logic. Now, what is AI system? There is a predefined region or logic, or there is a task which is defined that you have to perform this particular task, right? So the AI system processes information, performs computations, and as per the pre-designed uh, uh, like architecture or blueprint that you have said earlier. Now, what is feeding to the AI system is data, pre-trained models, if any, and additional logic that can go to the AI system. Now, ultimately what it generates, it generates the predictions, the recommendations, et cetera. So these are the three things that it is doing. Now, given that background, why explainability and how explainability makes those black box computations white box? How it is unboxing the black box models? Now, since the models on itself or on themselves, they cannot explain things, we need to have extra or additional uh, logic or programs that should help in explaining the predictions. That is part of your explainable AI. Now, what is a responsible AI? Responsible AI is execution of AI systems that takes the accountability, that is bias-free, the results are quite interpretable, the results are reliable, and as well as on and uh, as per demand, we should be able to explain it to anyone that why these predictions are being made. Now, suppose there is a credit decisioning that has to happen from any kind of a banking or uh, like a extending loans kind of a function. So the responsibility here is accountability first. If I'm not providing the loan to somebody does that mean the person is not eligible? Or if the person is eligible, my model doesn't know how to evaluate the risk associated with it. So accountability is important in this case. Now, interpretability is, now if it is associating or generating a probability score of a default, which is quite very high. Now, 
how do I interpret this? How do I interpret the probability scores that are associated with the predictions, right? So interpretation of parameters, understanding the parameters, which gives or which helps you in making changes to the input parameters, and you could expect like better result from the output, right? Now, reliability is about if I'm generating the predictions and it should be good enough. If I'm generating random results, now people will have will not have enough faith on the system that it is generating the predictions, right? Now, bias is, I'm going to explain what is biasness and there are, there are different kinds of biasness. Now, why model explainability? Because in any kind of a decision-making process, if there is a predictive model and there can be a statistical model, it can be a machine learning model, it can be neural network models or deep learning models. Predominantly, the deep learning models are neural network models. The machine learning models can be of neural network, can be of a non-neural network or parameterized models as well. The statistical models are basically mostly parameterized because you can estimate certain parameters and you can evaluate how these parameters are going or doing. Rule-based system is simple, very, very simple. It's a business kind of rule-based system where if it is EFLs, conditions are there and the conditions are validated or conditions are satisfied, you can check. So rule-based system is pretty transparent enough and model explainability is very, very high. However, the other models like statistical models still, it is quite explainable, quite easy. However, the some of the machine learning models, they are explainable. However, the performance of those models in terms of accuracy sometimes is not uh, like very great and in performing complex tasks. That's why deep learning models are in place. Now, the deep learning models, they are quite good at making uh, the, the model predictions with high accuracy. However, the neural network models lacks the explainability part of it. They are pretty less in terms of explainability. Now, that is why, why explainable? So sometimes it is the regulatory or compliance needs that makes you explain the predictions or the models. Sometimes uh, the explanations help the end users Sometimes the explanations are also useful to find out the regions and what we could do around those regions and how can we restrict it from happening in the future. Similarly, accuracy point of view also. So those three angles are important in terms of explainability. Now, there are various types of explanations. Now, before elaborating what are the types of explanations, it is important to understand who needs explanation, right? So think about a very simple example of, let's take increase in cholesterol level could, uh, could lead to increase in blood pressure level. There is some kind of correlation or association attached to it. Now, can I predict, let's take somebody's uh, or some, some samples, uh, taking some samples data, can I, can I predict the blood pressure levels of a person based on various parameters? It includes diet, exercise and cholesterol labels, which is like either uh, like uh, 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 maybe other habits. And so there are various factors. If I can consider all other factors and I can make a prediction. Now, if, it, if the model predicts that this person is going to get high blood pressure in next couple of months, the first thing the person would want is, how did you know that? Can you explain me which factor is actually causing this or which factor is actually leading to uh, predict that this person is going to have high blood pressure in the future. Now, this is just one example of it. Now, obviously the person would be requiring the descriptions. Now you can tell me, okay, I can say, okay, the salt intake or the kind of a food or maybe uh, lack of exercise, these are the, could be certain factors. Now, if lack of exercise, now what can I do about it? Okay, now you go ahead and take a walk, start jogging or, start some physical exercises, right? So if we know the reasons, we can take precautions. If we know the reasons, then we can do something about it. We can seek help from people. We can recommend, we can, if we identify some incorrect thing, then we can correct ourselves. Now for that, we need to know the reasons. That is why whenever somebody is making a prediction, we need to understand how these predictions are getting generated. That's why the, uh, the end users, they need explanations. The 
regulatory or compliance uh, point of view they also need to they know they also need the explanations uh, the data scientists when they are debugging the model to figure out why the model made such a uh, prediction they want to understand uh, what went behind it so model debugging now at a very high level the types of explanations can be of technical and non technical non technical would be either the user based which means the user is getting benefited out of non technical explanations simple words if i can explain it to someone about the predictions and the reasons behind it then the person can make corrections or changes to the lifestyle or whatever it is society acceptance also if it is transparent simple enough easy to explain to anyone definitely everybody would like the system everybody would like the ai system owner benefit means whosoever is executing such ai systems they will also get benefited out of it because the people are adopting the models and its predictions okay now the technical description or technical explanation of it it is like sometimes the data scientists or ml engineers they have to debug whether this prediction generated by the machine is it correct is it accurate enough or there is some kind of bug in the system so they have to debug to figure out why such predictions are being made and what we can do about it similarly regulatory needs or compliance needs also they want to understand what kind of models is the model differentiating behaving differently under different circumstances or is it like standard model or standard standard practice so these are some of the reasons or uh, like you can say factors that could lead to a need for explanation the types of explanations now what is significantly different today is that and what exactly the ai model is trying to do in traditional system we have input data we have output data so as we know for example we have data on banking industry and uh, about the credit extending the credit and we know historically who has defaulted who has not defaulted now if we use the input and output and we know the formula that how to arrive at the output that is default and no default of a credit risk and using the banking data right if we know the formula we can start to use it however sometimes the formula is not known to us sometimes we would want the model or we would want the computer system on its own should give a formula to us now that formula can be a linear formula it can be a non linear formula it can be any type of formula right it could be polynomial it could be any other thing now what is that formula how do i get that formula now that is why the ai model training would be required so you can feed the data and the input and output both will interact to create this kind of function or this kind of relations based on the patterns of the input data and that is getting captured in the ai models and the model can be used for deployments okay so that's the uh, in a, in a nutshell what is what is the uh, what is all about the model training and what is all about ai models now while training the models there is potential like uh, unconscious bias or sometimes maybe a conscious bias sometimes it is unintentional but sometimes it it could be intentional as well that we don't know so there are certain areas where the bias could be introduced unknowingly to the system as well so we have to make uh, like systems and processes that restricts those biases now if those biases exist uh, in the prediction process or uh, like modeling process then it could lead to like uh, like it it could hamper the trust that people have on the system on the ai system so those kind by of, those kind of biases need to be removed from the ai system the first bias is data bias now when i say data bias it could be as i said unintentional for example collecting more information from a from one group less information from another group that means your model has learned the majority of data and it follows that path the minority of data or the minority class from which the data belongs to the model doesn't know what is the pattern over there as an example if i'm going to there are two kinds of behavior and 80% of your data it actually takes uh, like first class and the second class it takes only 20% of the data so your model your model is biased towards the first group itself right so data bias whether we should 
collect equal amount of information or balanced amount of information from each of the groups so that we can remove the biasness in the data selection to build the models. Yes, of course, that we can do. Now we have to make protocols over there to understand if there is a specific group that has been given more importance in terms of collecting the, the data, then we have to balance out the data. So that at a, at a later point in time, we can avoid the training biases or the, the uh, algorithmic biases, okay? The second kind of bias is after data bias is training bias. So training bias means uh, what percentage of data we want to train. Is it like 50%, 60%, 80%, 90%? What, what is the training process and how we are actually training the models? Now, the training process itself, if I do an early stopping, I just train the model only for a couple of iterations, like five, 10 iterations, and I stop there. Okay, I'm getting decent accuracy and I'll go ahead, right? That could be the early result. It's not a fully trained data. I should ideally train on 100 epochs or 100 iterations or more than 100 iterations just to ensure that if there is no significant improvement in the accuracy after training at a very high, high iteration or epoch rate, then my model is stable. Now, if I'm doing an early stopping there and taking the decisions well in advance, then it's a training bias. Similarly, interpretation bias. Interpretation bias is you uh, get a model, the model equations is there, the probability values associated with each of the equations are there. Now, how do you interpret it? Now, interpretation has to happen in a very transparent manner, right? Now, let's take, uh, for example, I am, uh, let's take so and so, I am belong to so and so group. And if suddenly the model is becoming unfavorable to me, I will say that, hey, because I'm so and because I belong to so and so group, the model is unfavorable to me. But it's not the case, it's otherwise. The model actually doesn't know whether you are from a specific group or not. The model actually a, a model doesn't interfere or differentiate between one group versus the rest of the groups. So interpretation wise, we have to be pretty, pretty cautious about uh, like uh, choose up words or languages in terms of interpreting the model predictions. Now, coming back to algorithmic bias, it's about the choice of algorithms. Now, the again, black box models that we know that those are neural network models. Now, should I go ahead with neural network with the two hidden layers, five hidden layers, thousand hidden layers? What should be that uh, number of hidden layers? Similarly, the choice of other algorithms also. Why am I using neural network? Why not other algorithms, right? So basically we have to, for a corresponding task or for a specific task, we have to run various kinds of algorithms. We never know which kind of algorithm is going to work. So if you are an experienced data scientist, the experienced books, they would definitely know that what kind of algorithm, which kind of scenario it should work. Now, if they know that the kind of scenario where it will work and what kind of model it is, fair enough. But if somebody doesn't know the choice of algorithm, it should be done like ideally you should train all algorithms at least once to figure out if it is working or not working. Different kinds of algorithms. When I say different kinds, it starts with a linear model, then it extends to a non-linear model, then it goes to the uh, non-parametric models like a decision tree and all. Then it goes to uh, something like uh, ensemble models. The ensemble models can be of uh, three types, bagging, boosting, and uh, stacking. It can explore mathematical models like support vector machines. It can go to, again, neural network, single hidden layer, multi hidden layer. And uh, so, so these are different variations of uh, uh, algorithms or could be the Bayesian algorithms, could be frequentist based approaches. So there are so many types of algorithms. Now, if one specific algorithm that produces better result and we are missing it, now we are biased towards algorithmic side of things, right? So those biases and the bias mitigation strategies that I, that I speak about right now slightly, because bias mitigation, uh, the bias mitigation, uh, you can say the strategies, it could differ depending on the organization, depending on the data type, depending on the process, there are different strategies around it. Okay, now very simple example of where the, the uh, like today and tomorrow scenario, if I have to just to compare, it's an image classification problem where you show the training data of various images like the people, places, person, animals, 
objects and uh, various things to the machine learning model. What does the model do? It learns the process. In learning process, it first converts those images into pixels. Those pixels are being uh, interpreted by applying convolution layers to bring the high dimensional data to a low dimensional space. And then the image, once it is getting converted to a low dimensional space, you can identify those pixel values as numbers. Those numbers can go to the input layers and those input layers, they learn the patterns by, uh, like, by going through various neurons in the present in the hidden layer and it produces the output. And finally, the output tells you whether this is the object, what is the probability associated with it, right? So question here is, how do you know that whether it is a cat or a dog? So suppose the prediction says the 93% probability is that it's a cat. Now, if it's a cat, right, why did the model predict it as a cat? We know this is cat, but why did you do that? Why the model did that, right? Why not something else? Now, you should be able to explain. There is a 93% uh, chance is that the features of this cat is similar to the features of the cat that we have seen in the training data itself, right? Now, the cat cannot be recognized as, a, as an aeroplane. The cat cannot be recognized as a horse or any kind of a dog. It cannot. So why not something else? Because the features are quite different. The features of this output object is quite different from features of the rest of the objects. Now, when do you succeed? I will succeed when I know exactly what are the differentiating factors, what are the key factors that differentiates this object from the rest of the objects in the training data itself, right? Now, when do you fail? So you will fail when you cannot differentiate the critical features. The critical features could be uh, like the places and the prominent uh, that, that would make, recognize this without looking at the rest of the features, right? That's why they are called prominent features or important features uh, in any kind of images, right? Now, if you are making the right prediction, why should I trust, right? How can I, uh, like, maybe, uh, how can I trust you? How can I trust the, the predictions or the results, right? So there are so many things around it, and this is only associated with image processing. The same thing goes to even uh, audio processing, video processing, natural language processing using text, and also it is applicable to structured data as well, right? So these are certain things, and now going back to how part of it, how do we make it explainable, right? So we know, we are saying that the reason for explainability, we know what are the limitations of uh, those explainability uh, uh, things and how do we make these things explainable? So there are various Python frameworks or availability of libraries are there. As an example, there are libraries like Lime on, on the left-hand side that you see here. This is called a Lime framework, local, interpretable, and uh, model explanations, L-I-M-E. This is something which is associated with SHAP, Shapley, Additive, explanations okay so so uh, so this is shapley explanations this is lime based explanations this is lev so lev is a uh, larger framework and under this it uses various other extensions for example skater le5 these are few python based libraries that uh, that has been developed or people by people to make those models explainable right to make the models more explainable especially the neural network ones. Uh, there are frameworks like, for example, uh, SmoothGrad, DeepShift. So uh, these, these frameworks, they sit on top of uh, the Keras-based models or PyTorch-based models to make the neural networks explainable, right? So sample functions, sometimes it takes uh, like few records to generate the interpretations, which means it generates the output with certain probabilities associated with it. And also sometimes it does the weight calculations using uh, regression-based models. So the idea here is use a combination of various libraries and try to figure out what kind of explanations are required. Now explanations could be like, uh, like importance of the features, understanding the key differentiators between the predicted sample versus rest of the data that you have, 
understanding uh, the distributions, your data distributions, understanding uh, maybe the probability scores associated with the predictions and all those things, right? So the important point here is those libraries should be pursued, explained, should be utilized, and it should be part of the code base. Wherever there is a predictive model, wherever there is a AI model, now this explainability should sit there as a module. In case somebody wants to know the reasons behind it, then we should be able to leverage this explainability in order to explain to the end user. Okay. Now, the next thing is about what are the methods of explainability? We know the reasons, we know the libraries, and then this is very, very important or super important, I would say. Why? There are three kinds of explainability or three methods of explainability. Textual explainability, visual explainability, example-based explainability, right? Now, who wants what kind of explainability? There are different personas in the explainability world because when you look at the business side of things, there are different kinds of people. There are technical uh, people like technical technical managers, or maybe you can say engineering managers. So that is one role. There are data scientists, or maybe statisticians, or uh, maybe you can say mathematicians. So there is a, another group. Then the third group is about the business folks, who are quite senior people in the organization. And uh, they are no more uh, interested into the technical descriptions or technical meaning of the words they wanted in plain simple language, right? So the textual response, the text, textual explainability using either natural language processing or natural language generation and generating the summaries around it, this is useful for the business users or this is useful for the senior business folks who are or who are trying to understand why the model made such a prediction or why the model is taking such kind of decisions. They would be interested in knowing the, the things in a simple language, without any mathematics, without any jargons, without any technical terminologies, right? So generating a summary out of explainability in plain text, expressing it using natural languages that is useful for people who are business friendly people. Now, that is visual explainability. The visual explainability for the, uh, again, the data scientists. Now, here, why visual explain? They know what exactly the code is doing. They know exactly what the program is doing. However, they want to get a visibility of it. So, in a, in a visual way, if we can explain the rules, if we can explain the, the flowchart of a tree-based system, then they would understand it better. That why such, why such kind of... A, predictions are being made by the machine learning models or a deep learning model. Now, there is the third person I about example-based. Now, here comes the role of the, the engineering managers and all where they would want to see the examples, right? Using common examples, using business scenarios. So can we contextualize it into the existing business practices and take some examples from the existing business practices in order to differentiate this is what it is and this is what it is right for example if a person you are identifying and that person is part of a, a segment which spends a lot which which makes more expenditures out of their income and if you find another person exactly similar to this person you can associate okay this example is very close to this example right and here you can say why the model is predicting this person is likely to spend more because his existing spend is very high right so that is why example based give more examples give more explanations and the business scenarios where what kind of explainability would be required right so looking at the whole explainability framework now these strategies these methods can be used to explain the predictions better the decisions of any kind of a machine learning and deep learning models can be uh, can be again uh, uh, like we can make it white box. We can make it uh, explainable to the end users. Now the users can just look at, or maybe the stakeholders, they can just look at the regions in, in summary. They can look at the regions in a tree-based flowchart. They can look at the summaries, maybe using some common examples, right? So the methods of explainability will augment, will help us in making 
the or in, in unboxing the black box models right sometimes full description or full explanation is not possible sometimes we have to take help of additional uh, tools or additional utilities in order to explain it what does this mean this means if you have a predictive model and directly you cannot get the importance of the features because the model does not provide that kind of functionality to print all the important features now in those scenarios you can take a proxy so proxy variable could be maybe either taking probabilities is either taking conditional probabilities either taking some other additional metrics from the model apply some conditions scoring logic etc so do something just to make it explainable and understand which feature is more important right so having said that now uh, we are at the end of uh, uh, the talk now we will open the forum for questions and please you, if you have any questions you can go ahead and ask me Hey, thank you so much, uh, Pradita. Actually, uh, we, 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 are, we are attending to one of the most pressing questions in uh, our, uh, you know, contemporary questions right now uh, with, with, with uh, the buyers and the other issues in algorithms. Uh, right. uh, let us look at what are the typical questions people come up with when you talk about like, you know, this particular topic, like, you know, can you come up with at least the typical questions people ask you? Right. So the common questions people ask is like, hey, I have a model and uh, I'm, I'm making a prediction over here. Now the question is, typical questions, why should I trust your model? What do I, what do, I do to make it trustable? How it can be, uh, uh, how, why should people trust the model? Right. Simple example. The same, uh, again, I can say the, the credit uh, uh, example. Right. So let's take, I'm applying a loan or a credit card and it's been, so the bank like XYZ bank, it is rejecting my application. Right. So I would like to understand why. Typically what answer we will get, we'll get typically is that, okay, your score is pretty low. That's why you won't be uh, given a loan. Right. So, but that's, that's not the answer. Right. So score is a very neutral thing. I want to want, I want to know the reason behind it. Is it like my experience is not enough? Is it like my take-home salary is not enough? Is it like I'm from a different, uh, uh, let, let's take a section of the people in a society? Is it because I don't have enough credit history? Is this because of something I have uh, taken in past and I did not pay it back to the bank? So what is the exact reason that today we don't tell people, right? Now that is how, if you, if you become more transparent, people will have trust on your predictions. People will have trust on your uh, uh, like generating output and they can definitely understand what is, uh, what is happening in the modeling side of things and they can interpret things also. So to make the models more transparent and if you, the more you make it transparent, people will have trust on it. Yeah, it, it means a lot right now in, in our current uh, you know, uh, scenario where we are in the nascent stages of, uh, you know, where I, AI has been like, you know, uh, implemented in almost every part of our life. Uh, there's a lot of explaining to do. So, yes, uh, we have a question from Komal Agarwal asking, why do we use example-based technology? Why do we use example-based technology? Yes, I'll, I'll give an example. Okay. so. Uh, Let's take uh, in a healthcare scenario or healthcare example, okay? I'm using, let's take a, a model to predict uh, what would be my weight in, in next uh, two to three months, right? It depends on my food intake. It depends on my activity levels. It depends on the age, gender, uh, could be the geographic location I live in, could be the demographic factors. There are so many factors to it, right? But if you just look at the reason, the primary reason is the workout. The more you work out, the more you become active, probably the weight loss would happen. Or the reverse also could be true in terms of food control. So the more uh, I'll, I'll eat healthy food, fruits, vegetables, etc., 
then I'll become healthier and my weight will also will be balanced, right? That we know that. Now, if two people are there, somebody's weight is getting reduced by maintaining a healthy lifestyle, eating uh, healthy foods and making good exercises and everything. But for the other person, he's also doing the same thing, but his weight is not reducing. Why? The model predicted same thing for the two people because the demographic factors, activity levels, everything remains the same, right? The prediction is different for two people. However, their input data is similar, right? Okay. Sometimes so, that is why we have to explain why it did not work for one person, why it worked for another person. Yeah, got it. Uh, we have Naomi asking, why are we using black box models in AI when we don't need to? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's passing over to the next question from Clothing asking, why do you care so much about explainable algorithms in defense of a black box uh, system? Right, right. See, complex use cases. Uh, we talk about very simpler use cases. Now I'll give you uh, the scenarios of a complex use case. What is a complex use case? Okay, so the complex use case here is uh, uh, based on the retina scan. Can we identify the diabetic retinopathy? Right. What input you are taking? You are taking just a retina scan of somebody, and you are training a deep learning model over there. This model is predicting whether this person is going to have diabetic retinopathy in future or not. Right. Now, if I generate wrong predictions there, I generate, okay, Mr. X is, is going to be uh, having diabetic retinopathy in future, right? At this moment, this person has no issues. He is comfortable in doing everything as a normal person. He has no issues. So he would be wondering that, why did you make such a prediction? Now, can I explain it? Yeah. I, I, I have to explain it, that why I'm predicting such things. That is why. And this kind of things, when, when, I, when I have to explain it, now I have to look at how did I arrive at this? Now, if I am using a neural network model or a deep learning model to arrive at such kind of predictions, then I need to have a mechanism to explain those deep learning models, which are considered to be black box models. Right. Yes. Now, simple, just another example is let's take Facebook's profit. Profit is a forecasting algorithm, right? Any kind of stock prices you can predict using the forecasting algorithm, which is called a profit. You can just do a little bit Google search, you'll get profit algorithm. It is a very simple interface it has, and it's a very simple API. You write one line of code, pass a time series, and it will generate a prediction out of it. Okay. Now you generate the possible next, next one week stock prices of a stock XYZ. Now you compare it to actual, right? After seven days, you compare the prediction generated by the model. You compare with the actuals. If the actuals and predicts, predicted are aligned, then your model worked. You are happy, no issues. But if the predictions and actuals are quite deviating and quite opposite, We'd be wondering what went wrong in my training process. Why the model did not predict it rightly, right? Now, how can you explain it? Why the model given uh, like gave a wrong prediction? So we need mechanism to understand why the model predicted in a right way or in a wrong way. We need to we need to know the reasons behind it. Yeah, I have, I have, I have, a, I have another question, uh, Padita. I want your take on it. Mm -hmm. Can you explain the call for big companies to make their algorithms open source to evaluate the accountability or bias? So, will the open sourcing of algorithms solve the data bias or the training bias or the choice of algorithm bias or the alg algorithmic uh, interpretation bias or all of this above? Which will what will it, uh, in the end, uh, open sourcing do? Right. See, open sourcing of code bases or algorithms or APIs by any other organization or like that will not solve the purpose. 
So the purpose here is it is the, the entire decision rests on the AI engineer or the data scientist. Now you are collecting information, you are collecting data to build a or to develop a model. First, you have to see the data is balanced or not balanced. Is it biased towards somebody? Is it biased towards some class, some group, some sections? Right? It should be uh, like the data should be first balanced, and that will take care of your data bias. Algorithmic bias, again, that is up to a human bias, right? I can use a linear model. I can tell my linear model gives you 75% accuracy, and you should take it. Now, if I use a neural network model, I am at 95% accuracy, right? Somebody could ask me that why you did not use the neural network model? Why you gave a simple uh, linear model to me, which is a MX plus C? Now, I'll say that if you tell me that how did you make this prediction, I can easily explain it because this is MX plus C. If you ask me how 95% accuracy you raised in prediction, but it is actually not predicting correctly, I cannot explain the neural network based model because it's a black box model. Right? The black box model are typically used in complex scenarios where simpler models are not going to work. Right? You want you, you want to see the scenarios like, for example, right? Uh, there is a lot of randomness in the data. One simple example, there is a UCI machine learning repository. There are so many data sets out there. You can just look at, there is a data set called wine quality data set. It's a wine quality, you can use it as a prediction, you can use it as a classification also. Whichever model you use, the best accuracy is 62% or 63%. Beyond 63%, you cannot achieve high accuracy for that particular model because the patterns are quite different, quite complex. You can use neural network model also there, but your accuracy cannot go beyond 63%. Why? Because the pattern is like that. So black box means only the neural network models are considered to be black box. And there are specific use cases, right? So if your input data has few features, five to six features, you can easily train a neural, uh, simple linear model. Now, if your accuracy is not improving, you have to introduce either additional data or additional features. Those additional features can be interaction features. It can be uh, like uh, polynomial features to make the model learn the complex patterns. Now, what if after even introduction of polynomial features, your still model accuracy did not improve, which means there could be a higher degree of a polynomial relationship between various features. Now, you cannot do handcrafted features for those specific set of features and in, include in the model. This is a quite cumbersome manual process on the part of a data scientist to make predictions. Got it. That is why you need an automated system that can generate n number of interaction features on its own and create those, for, those, those formula for you, which is easier to apply, easier to adapt. That's why you need the black box models. Yeah, I think uh, um, I think that explains uh, one of uh, other other questions which was posted here. Uh, why use black box models by Niharika Acharya? So yeah. we have uh, Sean asking us, what are some classic examples of uh, use of uh, this? Uh, I think she's making sense of the black box models. Mm -hmm. Like I think you gave us one of your uh, diabetic retinopathy. Yeah. Yeah. Can you give us give us one more? Sure. So let's take one example of this uh, uh, predicting the sentiments of products. You are on. Let's say you are planning to buy a new iPhone. You are on one of the e-commerce portal. You are just checking the reviews of a particular iPhone, right? Now you have some positive reviews and some negative reviews also. Okay. Now. You want to develop such kind of uh, framework for any other uh, like product or any other organization. Now, in on a, on a shopping platform, it's already there. The model is already there. You post a comment, the model will automatically predict whether it is a positive sentiment or a negative sentiment. That is how they will do a positive review and negative review, right? They will classify it. You put a comment, the moment you put a comment, they will just do a classification, positive and negative. 
Now you start using a neutral words. Like you say that, okay, you as a customer, you put a like a neutral review. You say that uh, I like this phone, but the price is very high. I like this, but I this like this. So you put neutral statements there and see where it is getting classified, right? There is no neutral option on the website, right? Either it is a positive review or it's a negative review. If you put a balanced comment over there, and if it gets a positive review classified, then you would be wondering why. I have given a neutral review, right? Why did you do a classification of a positive review? Now, can you explain me how your model works over there? Not really. Right. Great yeah. job. So, ideally, wherever there is a model involved, either machine learning or deep learning or neural network, if there is a model involved and that model is generating predictions, it is the duty of the model to explain how did I arrive at this particular prediction. That's why it is important. Hey, thank you so much, Pradeepta, because you know why? We are in a, a, a very early stages of implementing so much of this into our everyday life. And uh, it is good that we are going ahead and asking uh, valid questions to know how far uh, without any checks and balances will the system go without asking the right questions. Anyway, uh, thank you so much for your time, everyone. And uh, thank you, Pradeepta, for taking your time out. I know you're a very busy man. So uh, really appreciate you taking your time out. And uh, really uh, thank you, everyone, for joining in. And we'll keep you posted on the uh, upcoming uh, series of our, uh, uh, of our webinars. Okay, And uh, have a nice weekend. And thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.